You take the darkness and make it as light. Hearts that were dead in sin, you raise to life. You take a barren place and make it spring. Let the Redeemer of God rise up and sing. Good afternoon, church. Right, please remain standing. And I am going to read to you from Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, oops, I can't see without my glasses. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Please be seated for a short moment. So... We are actually praying about uh, life groups today, IBC Life. So we're we're in a season of prayer. We're playing for the individual um, sections of the life in this church. And today we're going to concentrate on our life groups. Um, Basically, the term life groups is used to represent the fact that we wish to live our life together in Christ and sometimes we use the term home groups which is totally interchangeable um, and is basically a home group is used to represent the fact that we are a Christian family living life together with our Christian brothers and sisters so life groups come together more or less each week of the year and they are certainly places where we study the word together Each life group will be studying the same texts and maybe even discuss the same questions. And they are asked, as they are asked as part of the sermon every week. Life groups are a place where people can discuss the implications of the text in question, where they can share testimony of what the Lord has done for them in their lives. As we studied last week, it is a lifelong challenge to truly love the Lord with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our strength, and the term that was discussed at my life group last week, with all of our everything, with all of our muchness. All of us have this challenge every day, but in a life group, we can share our experiences. This encourages one another and builds each of us up in our faith. Life groups are a place where we can pray together 
for what each one of us are concerned about in any week. When we pray together and the Lord answers these prayers, which he certainly does, then the joy that this brings within the group is so uplifting, it really builds our faith to new heights and all the glory is given to God. Life groups are also a place where we can become accountable to each other, either as a complete group or in the relationships formed within the group on a one-to-one -one basis. It is not that you are expected to confess all of your sins on a weekly basis, but it is a place where whatever you are struggling with can be prayed for and you will receive love and support and prayer from the other members of the group. If we look around at this church, we see people who have come from all over the world, literally from the four corners of the earth, from many tongues, tribes, and cultures. It is, though, absolutely no coincidence whatsoever that you are sitting here in this church today, that you are here in this city at this time. You have been given spiritual gifts to build Christ church and you are here we as a church need these gifts you are simply not here by coincidence with these gifts the law gave them to you for a purpose and these gifts should be exercised life groups are a starting point where you can begin to understand and exercise these gifts where the life group can see the gifts that you have been given, where you can begin to gain more confidence in your gifts and learn how to use them. It is the starting point for involvement and service to this church as a whole. So we currently have life groups on all days of the working week, except on Friday. On Monday, Zach runs a group. On Tuesday, Pontus runs a group. On Wednesday, myself and Alison runs a group in Sultz. And on Thursday, Johnny runs a group in Kirpen. Actually, even on Fridays, there is a ladies' group once a month and a mums' group. So please, for your sake and for our sake, please get involved. Don't waste your time when you are here, no matter how short or how long your stay will be. So let us bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, Lord of all creation, we thank you that you have made us, you have formed us, you have given us life and purpose, you have made us beautifully and intricately, you know us intimately, and you made us in your own image. Father, you made us in your own image, and yet so often we become concerned that we do not know what you look like. So we thank you. that you gave your son to reveal your fullness to us, to reveal your glory, and that he shows us what your glory looks like every time we look at him. He shows us your compassion. He shows us your mercy, your grace, and your loving kindness. He shows us your goodness, kindness, and patience. He shows us your righteousness, justice, and faithfulness, and so much more. And when Jesus Christ came to the earth, he came to serve, not to be served. And it is in light of this that we thank you for our home groups. For these are places where we can come together to serve one another and see the glory of the Lord shine forth through the lives of those around us. These are places from which compassion flows. Patience and gentleness are exercised, where long-suffering and mercy can be seen to be beautiful and strong, where our love for you overflows into our love for our neighbour in the congregation of believers. We thank you for our home groups. They are often a home from home when we need a sense of belonging. They are often a place where we experience what it means to be family for the first time. But however it is, we thank you that its function is rooted and grounded in you, knowing you is its purpose. 
We thank you for the meal shared for both physical food and spiritual sustenance. Thank you that these can be times of refreshing and times of strengthening, that we can laugh with one another and be serious, that together we can build one another up with the strength to persevere and endure, and then we can celebrate together when the victories come. Thank you, Lord. And in serving, we praise you. We praise you because we have, you have raised up leaders who love you enough to submit their time and energy to your service and in service to others. All praise to you for their desire to love you in this way. We ask now, Lord, for multiplication in this area, for new leaders to be raised up according to your will and your leading for this church. Raise up men and women with a heart of obedience, Lord. You know who they are, so we ask that you open their ears and hearts to hear your voice. We praise you for the homes that are open for hosting the groups, for those who serve by providing meals. We are thankful, Lord, for generosity in the hearts of your people that they give so freely back to you what is already yours. Again, Father, we ask for multiplication to see what is already yours. We ask for modification where hosting is needed, Lord. Please supply. Sometimes we have the willing heart to teach, but no space to hold a meeting. And so we ask, Father, that where one part is ready, the other is supplied. And we thank you for all those who commit their lives one to another and attend these groups. We praise you for their diligence in praying for each other, for their willingness to live life with each other and their increasing willingness to be accountable in their spiritual discipline and for their desire to walk in the knowledge of Christ, following him wherever he may lead. Again, Lord, we pray for multiplication. For those who may not know the joy of participating with you in this way, Father, incline the hearts and mind of each one of us to know your will for us in this matter. Show us how to join up in fellowship and to use our spiritual gifts for the building up of your church here in this city at this time. And lastly, Lord, we pray for Zach as he leads us in the exposition of your word. Guard his heart as he speaks that no word leaves his mouth that is not explicitly from you. And open the eyes of our understanding that we might walk in the fullness of truth as revealed by the word of God today. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let us continue our worship by singing. Christ the true and better Adam Son of God and Son of Man Who went tempted in the garden Never yielded, never sinned He who makes the many righteous Brings us back to life again Dying he Reverse the curse, then rising crushed the serpent's head. Christ the true and better Isaac, humble son of sacrifice. Who would climb the fearful mountain There to offer up his life Laid with faith upon the altar Father's joy and only Son Their salvation was provided Oh, what full and boundless love. Amen, amen. From beginning to end, 
Christ the story is the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Christ the true and better Moses called to lead the people home. Standing bold to earthly powers, God's great glory to be known. With His arms stretched wide to heaven, see the waters part in two. See the veil is torn forever, cleansed with blood we passed out through Amen Amen From beginning to end Christ's story is the glory Hallelujah Amen Christ the true and better David, lowly shepherd, mighty king. He the champion in the battle, where O death is now thy sing. In our place he bled and conquered, crowned him Lord of man. Majesty, he shall be the throne forever. We shall hear his people be. Amen, amen. From beginning to end, Christ the story is the glory. Amen. 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 From beginning to end, Christ the story is the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Christ the story is the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus 
turn our eyes to you. In church, I'll be doing the announcements, and there will be just a few for this week. Coming up on Friday next week, the 19th, as uh, Dean mentioned, it's once a month, we have the ladies' monthly meeting. So this is happening in this building um, from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., and there is a new topic which is called Reigning with Christ, Understanding Our Place from Eden to Eternity. So if you're interested in joining, please speak to Kristen, you can speak to Alison, um, or Caroline as well, yeah. Uh, the second one would be uh, on the 28th, on Sunday, we will have the Homeless Ministry Outreach, and this is happening at the Köln Hauptbahnhof, that's the meeting point. Um, this starts at about 1.15 p.m. and uh, goes up to about 3, 3.30, and then after that, 
the group returns to church so they can be part of the service as well. If you are interested, uh, please don't just turn up in Kulna, but off, speak to someone from the homeless ministry. And Andre is there at the back. If uh, you're interested in joining, speak to him. Um, so that's it for the announcements for this uh, month. Um, one thing I would like to um, talk about is the social media ministry. If you, if you are aware, if you are using social media, you'll see that we are on Facebook, we are on Instagram. Um, so if you, um, we need help. So if you have the willingness to serve and you're willing to learn, then um, we are more than willing to, to teach you uh, the ropes. Um, what, we are, what we usually do is communicate to the church, so internally and externally. So that means we communicate internal things, uh, such as what happens during the week. Um, we communicate those things, um, but also externally. So we, this is an opportunity for us to reach out to other people as well outside of the church. So this is a, uh, an interesting ministry for sure. Uh, if you do use social media and you're interested in joining, come speak to me. Um, yeah, and uh, finally, I'll ask, uh, need to ask Zach to come up to introduce his life group. This is not how I run my life group. <laughs> no, um, I'm Zach, for those who don't know me. Um, every Monday we have uh, our live group at, um, used to say Hansering, but actually it's in Ehrenfeld. Um, I'm leading this group and, um, and hosted by Carlos and Samara. They opened their house for uh, us to come there and open the word. Actually, Dean said a lot today about what we do in live group, so I don't want to repeat everything, but it is, it is, Fun. It is 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 um, like a family coming together. Um, I must say, since I come here in Cologne, um, this live group has been my family since eight years, maybe nine years. Seeing people come and go, um, and and it's a blessing to see how people uh, grow, um, how they learn, how they how they um, yeah just interact with each other and also serve in the church. So if you want to come, we, um, yeah, like I said, it's with Carlos and Samara and Erevan, but not this month. So it's going to be confusing because they're going to be on holiday and other things. So from, for this month, if you want to come, let me know. Come to me. Um, I will, we will sort that out. And um, from, um, from next month on, um, it will be then actually at uh, Carlos and Samara's. Yeah, that's it. We start at 7, sorry, um, I just uh, realized it. Uh, we start at 7, we have a meal together, um, and then at 8, um, we start with study and, um, yeah. Actually, for this year, we have some extra activities um, and um, initiative in store, but if you want to know more about that, you just have to come to our library. <laughs> it's a teaser. So um, now we are in, um, at the time of our uh, worship where we are going to um, worship the Lord through our giving. Um, if you are uh, new here, it's your first time, you know, um, there's no obligation, but give from your heart as the Lord um, yeah, um, stirs you. Um, so yeah, let me pray for it and then uh, we can do this. Heavenly Father, thank you for who you are, thank you for how you provide, how you take care of us, Lord. Um, it's, it's like it said in your word, every good gift comes from above, from above Lord, and, and you never fail, Lord. And, and through this offering, we want to worship you, and we want to give back to, to your work, to your kingdom, to wherever you have destined this, this, this mon money, this fund to go, Lord, that it may... Um, um, yeah, exalt you and give glory to you and, and that we may um, be um, joyful in, in, in the fact that we can give to you, Lord. And it's an absolute privilege, Lord, um, that, we, um, yeah, that we, with the abundance that you give us, or with the little that you, we have, Lord, it's a, a worship to you, Lord. And 
because you never, um, yeah, leave us alone, Lord, you know, or always provide for us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good evening, good afternoon. Yeah, we, it's always getting used to uh, the new, new times we have. Um, it's good to be back here. It's been a while that I've been able to preach here. It was, uh, it was a time where uh, Johnny was shining the last seven weeks, um, David as well. Um, but it's good to be here. Um, as you know, uh, a lot of the, the men are not here. They are uh, having a blast in Switzerland. Uh, where they are at a men's conference. Um, we were just saying at the elders, uh, um, like, like three or four, four of our elders, three of our elders are there together with IGK, uh, people from there, and, um, and, and, and it's truly a blessing that they can do something like that, good fellowship, bonding. But also pray for their safe trip back home, because... <clears throat> um, I've heard it's snowing somewhere in several regions, and we want them back safe. Um, we are in a series um, called Called Out for a Purpose. Um, David preached the last two weeks um, on first, what is the purpose of IBC Cologne here? What is our purpose as a church? What is our aim? And... Um, and then um, last week he preached what is our motive. And th- today I will preach what are the tools that have been given. Um, he said it well last time. Um, it starts with the marching orders that the Lord has given us. Lord Jesus, before he went to heaven, Matthew 28, um, 28 verse 18, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them 
to observe all that I have commanded, and behold, I am with you to the end of the age. That's our purpose, and I think for where you are in this church or in another church, this is, this is the, the one commandment that he gave to us before he left, before he went to heaven. Um, this, this is important. Um, but now what does that mean for our church locally? David spoke about that. And, and, and that is to be missional in the area and in the context where the Lord has placed us. As a church, how can we be missional? Um, how can we fulfill this commandment? Last week, we, we focused on the motive, uh, what it looks like to love God and each other. And the people of Cologne and beyond, to those who are lost, how, how, how does that look like to, to love our neighbors? Um, and, 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 and the Bible verse that um, was focused on that was Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. It's our love for God and our neighbors. And that is directly con connected to the Great Commission. That's our motivation. It's love. He said it well last week. Um, that if we as a church want to grow, every member of IBC Cologne needs to understand the biblical motivation for that. I like that sentence, what he said. Because that underpins the Great Commission is the command to love. And the love that we have that stirs us to fulfill that commandment. It's together. This brings us to today, the tool, the, the tool or tools the Lord has given us to achieve this. And that tool is the word of God. God has given us his word, the Bible, the tool to fulfill that commandment. And it's, it's interesting. It, 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 is the, it, is, it, it teaches us the truth about God. God has chosen a book of all the mediums and of all the things he could use. He has chosen a book through which he reveals himself to man and, and, and what he requires of us to do, actually. And, and, and we learn about his will. We learn about his glory, our relationship with him and his creation. Um, it teaches us about the fall. It teaches us about redemption. We know that. About our faith and our life. It's the Bible, the Word of God. Our life in Him and with Him. But above all, it teaches us about Jesus Christ. The thread that runs through the whole Bible that brings salvation to mankind and restores our relationship with God. We also read in uh, 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, all scriptures breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It's through the word of God that we can live in truth. It's through his word that he has revealed himself, his heart, and when, when you look today in the, in the context of evangelism, how effectively do we use it? Perhaps it's good to examine our heart. How effectively are we using the Word of God in the context of evangelism? And do we obey and do we act on it? It's very interesting today because... There are so many truths nowadays. It's so subjective. It's so abstract, right? Um, and therefore, all the more the reason that we need to be absolutely sure and know the truth of God, that we are unshakable when it comes to when, what, what we know about God and how to live for God in this life and what he has called us to do. So let me pray, and then, and then we will look at uh, actually... Um, 
the book of James because we know the word of God um, um, is, is, is our guide. Um, he has given us instructions. But how does it look like um, uh, in the context of um, hearing the word of God and doing the word of God, right? And how does that look like? And, 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 and we'll look at that. Let me pray first for this message. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity that I can preach here. Um, please give me your strength and, and your filling of the Spirit that I may preach faithfully, Lord, and that um, we all may be changed, Lord, um, impacted, and that may lead to, uh, to action, Lord, and that it will not remain just in our ears, Lord. Um, thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So the letter of James. Um, James is just to give a, a short overview. It's we'll, we'll, just going to be an overview of chapter 1. But he wrote this letter to the believers that were scattered all across the world at that time, the regions, because they were, in, they were persecuted. And he wrote it to the, called the 12 tribes of the diaspora. And um, yeah, they probably fled at that time from Jerusalem. We all know Stephen, who was persecuted, and he was stoned to death because he uh, shared the gospel or preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. This in Acts 7. And, and in this first chapter, James is, begins with exhorting the believers to rejoice in their trials, right? Um, who does that, right, when you're persecuted and you're going to be rejoicing? Yet he is actually saying and spurring them on, we rejoice and consider how they can help to build their faith, you know, because that, that will um, lead to, to a, a stronger faith. And they fared for their lives, actually. Um, but James says, in that fear, he says, trust the Lord. And trust him without doubt. Later on, he warns them not to be proud of their earthly possession and wealth. So it looked like there were still people who, when they are persecuted, in their persecution, they were still having some... some some possession, and that became a distraction in their walk. Um, and then he's addressing their attitude of anger, um, how they should change that. There were some anger issues uh, amongst the brothers and, uh, and, and the congregation. And also how they should deal and put away all the yeah, um, moral filthness uh, and, and, and the wickedness that was happening actually amongst them. And, and instead of doing that, accepting the word of God, living by it and, and, and yeah, with all their hearts. Now that brings us to the passage, and that is James 1, verse 22 through 25. Um, you, may, you may remain seated. It's not so long. And um, it says here, But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving yourself, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he, what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing." So you cannot be an effective witness just by hearing the word of God. This implies action. James was very direct when he said this. He was clear. He said, we should not uh, just listen to it. Just do it. Do what it says. And you may, may have noticed that it, the word hearing was used, right? Um, that's because in those days, yeah, people, people did not have a Bible like we have today. They were hearing the Word of God. And I think it's maybe good to remind ourselves a little bit, the absolute privilege that we have today to have a Bible, each one of us. Some of us have maybe one or two or even more. But it's not that evident to have a Bible today or even on your smartphone. Like, um, there are still unreached nations that... They don't even have a Bible because it's not translated in their language. Or um, 
countries like South, uh, North Korea. It's forbidden even to have one. And, and with the consequence of even being sent to, to a labor camp for, I don't know, how many years. Can you believe that? Can you think about that? You have a Bible, and for that, they would send you for, I don't know how many years, to a labor camp. And I, and I once read about um, an interesting uh, and actually very powerful story of, uh, I think it's called, the book's called Let the, Na Let the Nations Be Glad, if you know it from John Piper. And it was this, it was this story of this group of pastors, and they lived somewhere, was it Indonesia or China? I don't remember. But they only had one Bible for all these pastors in that region. So they decided to tear the Bible in chapters, and they would each take a, a chapter, and they would only preach about that, um, that book, I meant. Only preach about that book. And, um, and then I thought it was, it's, 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 we, can't, we, don't, we can't think about that today. It's, when you hear that, and, and they were so happy to only have that. And the story was actually about the, the, a person who had the book Leviticus. So he was preaching like for a couple of months only from the book Leviticus. And we was like, wow. And very soon we will go through Leviticus, you know. And, um, but he said it was the most amazing experience and teaching ever, he said. It's the word of God. It does not leave you hungry. It fills you with his spirit and teaches what to do. So then what usually happened amongst the, the leaders in, in James's time, like I said, the church leaders, they would get a copy, and of the letter, they would read that out, uh, James's letter, and then afterwards, they would just share it amongst the other churches. That was a common thing to do. They did not have the, the print press or um, the, the advantages that we have today. So they were very focused on the listening. It was very important, and they were... In an oral culture, they were much more trained than we are now today. But still, I don't think it's something very evident. But what James was pointing out was that there was a problem between the hearing of the word and the doing of the word amongst the believers. Because normally a healthy believer, right, we can agree, has these two things in harmony, right? If you are a dedicated believer in Christ, when you read the Bible, you know when it convicts you, you act on it. And it was not happening. And James was observing that. He was observing a different kind of behavior. He was observing believers who have been exposed to the truth many, many times are now behaving as they have never heard from it. Anything. And it's not that they have never heard of it, but it comes from a, a, a place of self-deception. Um, they deceive themselves it said, it said here, um, verse 22, but be the doers of the word and not hearers, only deceiving yourself. They were deceiving themselves. But how were they deceiving themselves? Well, it, it was as if someone knows the truth and understands the action that was required, but just goes and ignores it and does nothing. Hearing the call but ignoring it. The call that required a response, not obeying to the instructions of our master. No, they were not doing it. And that's actually even worse, I think. What good are then all these pious and religious sounding words that we say, you know, about Jesus and, and about church? What does that matter if it's all hearing and not doing and that was a great danger, a great danger here in, in being a hearer and not a doer of the word of God, the danger of self-deception. And basically, Christians who, who behave like this, who deceive themselves, they think that they are benefiting from hearing the word, but actually, they were missing out. They were robbing themselves from that blessing. We know when you read the Bible and you are in it and and, 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 and you meditate on it, the richness that it gives you, the blessing, the guidance, the peace, the, the, the growth, the, 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 the intimacy with the Lord. 
I can go on. Uh, it's, it's, it's such a richness. They were missing out on that. And that is absolutely dangerous as a believer of Christ. As a, it, it takes you away from the truth. It takes you away from living the life of truth. So what are examples of, of deceiving yourself? How can we deceive ourselves by hearing and not doing? And one example is, for instance, by... I was looking for examples and found some. Is by being emotional or sentimental about the Word of God. God's Word is beautiful to hear, and it feels good, but there is no intention to obey it. Sometimes they think the words are beautiful, like I said before, or, but it's just true for someone else. It's such a beautiful thing. I think it's such a good passage for that person, you know, but not for you. Another way um, we can deceive ourselves is to be proud of our knowledge of the Bible. You may listen to sermons all the time and read books on a, around that topic and subject and doctrines, and we can talk about it. We love to debate, and you're even passionate about certain points, but you don't do anything with it. What, what does not matter then? It's just head knowledge. And this was actually what, happening, uh, what was happening in the church of Corinth. There were, there were Christians who were proud of certain preachers they knew or followed. And they celebrated them. I am for Apollo, remember? I am for Paul or Cephas. And they would identify themselves with these preachers. Creating factions. And it's not that, that they, they were bad, the preachers. It's just these people were doing that were not about doing the word. They were just uh, interested in, in the knowledge and debate rather than action. And we, we can have that today as well. I'm from John Piper and John MacArthur or Paul Washer. Name them. Or even in our church, David, Johnny, me. Doesn't matter. Right? Doesn't matter. We don't focus on that. In first, in, in first Corinthians chapter three, verse eight, it says, "Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is folly with God. For it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile." So let no one boast in man, for all things are yours, whether for Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and, all, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Very important. Now, in the context of evangelism, You can spend too much time in studying um, the Word of God, listening lectures, talking about God, and it's good, right? I mentioned it before, it's good. But you realize you do that so much that you don't take time to spend time with the lost, to, to share it with somebody who needs to hear it. You know all about it, but you're just keeping it to yourself, or you share it with those who already know it. And this is something to think about. I'm convinc convic um, convicted, excuse me. It's easy to, to do that in our context, to talk about it. When I shared it with my life group already. This is something that, that needs to change in my life as well. Because, yeah, I work as a freelancer. I work from home, and I don't have so much interaction with the outside world, and I need to really pursue that, and that is something that, that um, I need to do more. In 2017, I went to the U.S. to a Bible conference was in Wyoming, Laramie Valley Chapel. We've heard of this church so many times because that's where I went to do my master and Johnny and, and, and Jens and, and Mauricio now as well. But I went there in 2017 just for a week for a seminar. Um, 
I think Johnny was also there, um, where we would listen to uh, the preaching of several pastors every day. It was very tiring because I was jet lagged. But it was so encouraging to see so many godly men, just how they were handling the truth and how they were just about it and full of passion and they were preaching it. And, but there's one preacher that really impacted me. It was actually the keynote speaker. Because he gave a testimony of how he became from an Old Testament teacher at a university. I think he was a professor or doctor in, somewhere in the university in, um, in the U.S., then became a full-time evangelist in Bangladesh for 15 years. His name is Dr. Bill Barak, and he was, yeah, like I said, he was the main preacher. And, and, and he shared that he realized after a decade or decades, I don't remember the details of teaching, that he remembered or realized that he hasn't been focusing on sharing the gospel. He knew the word, this guy. I think he wrote a commentary of, uh, on Job in the Old Testament, uh, um, I think ESV uh, study Bible. And I think also some commentaries on Psalm. That's, yeah, he, he, he was a scholar. But a scholar realized that I am not sharing my knowledge or I'm not sharing this with the lost. So he went to Bangladesh for 15 years, he took his kids and his wife, preferably. But, um, but he did it, and it, he was led to Bangladesh. That was how God planned it for him. And it was not easy because he shared that although it was a blessing to step in faith and obedience to God, it had an impact on his family. He shared it, but he did it. There was action. I was inspired. I still think about it as an example how we can imitate those who have stepped in obedience. He's one of them for me. I was really struck about his, about his uh, response. But that was for him, like I said, some people, they have the same responsibility, the same calling that we maybe need to examine our own hearts. Are we doing it? But maybe not in Bangladesh, but where? Where is the, where is the action? Are you a doer and a hearer? Brings us to the next section. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But he looks into the perfect, but he who looks into the perfect law, law of liberty, and perseveres, not being a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, shall be blessed in his doing. There are two persons and there are two mirrors. That illustration of two people who are listening to God, both were looking in a mirror. The mirror is the Bible because the Bible reveals who we are. It reveals our thoughts, our attitude, and our actions. That's the Bible, right or wrong. They both looked in the mirror, but not in the same way. It was different. The first one looked at himself, but more specifically, the, that looking that has been described is like gazing at himself in the mirror. It is, it is careful. It is with scrutiny. It is, he is looking at himself, but it was, it was different. Because the mirrors that they have those days was like was a, a polished metal. It was not the mirror that we have today. You see, like, straight on, like, sometimes shocked in the morning. I don't know. But it was different. You, you had to take that plate, and you had to move it a little bit with the light and, 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 a, and a right angle so you can see. And then look, you know. How am I looking like? There is scrutiny. There is attention. But it's not the same attention as the second person. He also looks in the mirror. But it's different. Instead of the word gaze that's been used, it's the word piercing. He's like bending over with a strong expression, looking at the mirror with also the angles better. He is doing more than just 
observing the outside. He, he's, he's studying. Like he's studying his face. Every little thing, the details. It's the same language that's been used when John and Mary went to see the tomb of Jesus. In John chapter um, 20, verse 5 to 11. And they were trying to figure out what happened to Jesus. Where is he? We can't find them. They were studying this whole tomb. You know, I don't know how big it is, but if he's not there, he's not there. But they were still studying it in detail. Because it stems more of the, the impact that he's not there than the fact that it is a small tomb. James describes this first one who gazes as someone who sees his reflection of a mirror. As someone who's reading his Bible, but then after he's reading, he just walks off and forgets it. He's a forgetful hearer. Because he knows the Bible. Remember we said in the beginning? There are people who know their Bible. They want to debate about it. They want to study it and they hear it, you know. But when it comes to action in their daily life, it has no impact. Forgetful hearer. Is someone who who's clearly has not had his Bible as his priority. Someone who is deceived, deceived himself, not knowing the truth. But the second one, the second one is described as a person who fixes his eyes on the Word of God. He studies it and perseveres. His heart is open to receive God's teaching. He's open. What can I do? How can I change? Teach me. Lead me. That's a person who, who walks in obedience. He's doing what it said. And as we again consider in our church, um, ourself maybe, it is important to persevere in studying the Word of God. It says in, in verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law, the Word of God, that brings liberty, no longer slave of sin, right? But we, per, we persevere as we read the Word of God. We don't give up. Because the moment you, you take a step back, the moment you, 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 you neglect, you will feel the impact. We all know it. We all know it. We all know as you um, maybe haven't read your Bible for three, four days or some maybe longer, you start to forget things. It's so important, especially if we are... Um, as a church, gonna, we, are going, um, we are about the Great Commission. We are about sharing the gospel to the lost and, and expressing the love of God. We cannot take our eyes away from his word. It's so crucial in the work of evangelism. But you've got to first learn the truth and live the truth so you can share the truth. Because we believe if you don't do that, it can go, as a church, especially downhill. We are, we are a Bible-centered church, and we have mentioned that many times. It's, the Word of God is very central, and we believe it's infallible Word of God. It's true, trustworthy, and it has the authority of our lives. We believe that. But the moment you take steps away from that, the moment you stop believing one little thing or change one little thing, that's when you deceive yourself. And many churches have gone that, that route. And many churches don't exist anymore who have gone that route or became something else, but not a church of God. And with that obedience, there is blessing. It leads us to the last section. It won't take long anymore. But if we study the Bible diligently and do what it says, the Lord will bless us. 
He will bless us with more knowledge, right? Have you ever experienced you read more of the Bible and, 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 and you feel more filled in the knowledge of the Lord? There's more truth that you, that you are aware of or you are filled with it and, and it brings so much joy and, 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 and life. But the reverse is also true, right? I mentioned it before. If you neglect to hear and obey, you will experience a loss. You will forget things you used to know about the Lord. His commandment, his teaching. And, and, the, longer, and, 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 and the longer you do that and the, the severe it becomes, that leads to serious disobedience and a hardening heart towards God. Your heart becomes callous to the things um, that we as Christians uh, are called to do. You're not interested in evangelism. You're not interested in the church. You're not interested in one another. You're not interested in God. You need the word of God. For is the lamp unto my um, for is the lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, right? Psalm 119. But like Joshua was commanded in chapter, in Joshua chapter 1, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will go well, and you will prosper. We at IBC Cologne, we want to be a strong and courageous church with the word of God, in our hearts. Just like Joshua, we seek to conquer the city of Cologne, the surrounding areas, or maybe beyond, whatever the Lord has in store for us, making disciples of all the nations. And I pray that this is also your prayer, your desire, your conviction, your examination of your own heart, as I also have to do that. What kind of church do we want to be here? Amen. Um, I have a few questions. Let me pray first. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this message. It's, uh, it's uh, impactful, Lord, because it's recognizable. It's the moment we distract and, and neglect your word, we, we immediately experience it, Lord. It's easy to hear, but it's hard to do. And I pray, Lord, that you continuously convict us, Lord. That your Holy Spirit continuously lead us. That we as a church are accountable to one another. That we care for each other to that extent that we point out and ask each other, when is the last time you read your Bible? And that's out of concern, out of care, out of love. I pray, Lord, that we may, um, may grow as a church in, in the knowledge of you, Lord. May grow in love for you and for one another. That we may fulfill that commandment, Lord. That we may live out um, yeah, the Christian faith, Lord, the Christian walk. So we may glorify you, Lord. May please you, Lord. For that's what we are about, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, first questions that I have here. Take it with you, the live group, in the personal time or with whom you are. It's, how is your daily reading of God's words these days? Simple question, but I think it's a good one. Reflect on it. Is it the priority in your life? What are some practical ways of studying God's word? I think it's good to maybe as a life to sit together. How can we improve study God's word? Is it accountability? Is it different ways of hearing, doing, teaching? There are several ways maybe that you can think of how we can um, improve it. Accountability. And discuss which ones are most effective. Share and give an example of how your Bible reading has led you to action. Talk about it. It's encouraging to hear how your experience of obedience um, had led to 
blessing and fruit. And then, do you have a strategy for using God's word when you share God's, the gospel with someone? Do you have Bible verses ready in that conversation that, that, that you can share? Is there, is there a structure maybe? Who knows? That's it. Amen. God of grace, how often have I grieved thee? How seldom have I sung thy praise? And little do I know how much I need thee. And time again I turn away. For how my heart is hard and unbelieving For all I've done and left undone Your love is not reluctant to receive me My soul draws back but love says come he will not cast you out, he will not cast you out. Whoever enters in will forever dwell with him. Draw near, faint heart, draw near. Oh, love still bids you well. Turn away your very son Who died to call us friends When we were strangers And says to every sinner Come He will not cast you out He will not cast you out Draw near, faint heart, draw near. Love still bids you welcome here. O Lord of light, you call us out of darkness to turn aside from sin and live. And prodigals, we come to you for pardon. Oh, Abba, Father, take us in. He will not cast you out. He will not cast you out. Whoever enters in will forever dwell with him. He will not cast you out he will not cast you out whoever enters in will forever dwell with him draw near faint heart draw near oh love still bids you welcome here love still bids you
Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn, in the suffering, in the sorrow, when my sin the shore and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still than goes the anchor though I just and accuse I will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed Christ the sure and steady anchor through the floods of for worshiping with us today. Next week we're meeting again at 3 o'clock for fellowship and coffee and tea and at 4 for, for the worship service. And if you're interested in life groups, it's already announced, please talk to anybody. Ask them where do I find life groups and they will direct you to the right person. Um, before we leave, I want to read from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Now may the, pe may, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom we glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.